Committees uh, in conjunction with uh, Senate Bill 5194, then you are at the right place at the right time. So really glad to see you all here. I, excuse me, I keep seeing pop-ups on my screen. So welcome. I think what we'll do is uh, some quick state board introductions of the state board team here, and then we'll so go right into launching into the content that we have uh, prepared for everybody today. So with that being said, I will be introducing myself to begin with, and then I'll hand it off to my state board teammates uh, to introduce themselves as well. So we've got the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office team here, as well as Human Resources and our Student Success Center representing and uh, running lead on the Guided Pathways Initiative that is on your college campuses. So with that, my name is Ha Win. My pronouns are she, her, and I uh, live and play on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish and Puyallup tribes. And I will go ahead, and I'm, excuse me, I serve as the Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion here at the State Board. And I'll go ahead and hand the virtual mic over to my colleague, Melissa Williams, who is on the EDI team as well. Yes, hi, I'm Melissa Williams. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a policy associate for equity, diversity, and inclusion at the State Board. And I am living and working uh, on the traditional lands of the Cowlitz and the Chinook in Vancouver, Washington. Yeah. Should I pass to Julie? I am Julie Hust and I am the Director of HR at the State Board. And I don't know who to pass to, I guess. Claudine. Claudine. Good morning. My name is Claudine Richardson, and I serve as the policy associate for Guided Pathways in the Strategic Initiatives and Student Success Center. And I am on the central lands of the Spokane tribe, Children of the Sun. Great. Thank you, Claudine. And Melissa, if you would uh, run through a land and labor acknowledgement to launch us. Sure will, be happy to. So I will read aloud our uh, State Board Land Acknowledgement. As ECTC acknowledges that our community resides on the ancestral lands of the First Peoples, the Office of the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges is located in Olympia on the Coast Salish lands of the Nisqually, Cowlitz, and Squaxin peoples. We ask you to join us in celebrating the indigenous tribes of Washington by acknowledging their ancestral lands, their communities, and the past, present, and future generations of the native peoples across our good state. We also acknowledge that our nation and our institutions have benefited and profited from the free enslaved labor of black people. We recognize the entangled and interconnected histories of indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from their land and the plight of the black people who were forcibly brought to it. We acknowledge the enduring impacts of the African diaspora and lift up the contributions, talents and dreams of black communities. Importantly, we also acknowledge the immigrant and refugee labor that has contributed to the building of this country within our labor force, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked and undocumented peoples. We recognize and honor their important contributions to our good state and to this nation. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, so just a quick overview before we launch right in, as many of you are aware and may have attended our January um, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Info sessions with an overview of both Senate Bills 5227 and 5194. Uh, for purposes of today, we are dialing in specifically to the deliverable within Senate Bill 5194 around the faculty diversity model programming that is required for all community tech colleges to submit within their uh, DEI strategic plans um, that are written within uh, sections three, um, sub one of that particular uh, bill of 5194. So with that is a requirement that not only do colleges submit DEI strategic plans that includes a number of other deliverables, uh, the faculty diversity program is one of those requirements within that DEI strategic plan. So all colleges need to develop this faculty diversity program. It should be designed to provide for the retention and recruitment of all faculty from all racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds. And it should also be developed on proven practices and diversity hiring practices. Uh, so with that, uh, the work at the, the state board 
uh, our EDI team, our equity, diversity, and inclusion team, and HR teams here at the State Board work to develop some guidance to support you as you develop your own faculty diversity program. You'll see it on the link here uh, in front of you. We also have it uh, within the Google Drive documents that we've shared out with you in, re in reference to this particular event. So feel free to take a look at that. If you have any questions on that, uh, more than happy to walk through that with you as well. Uh, but uh, the faculty diversity model template intends to provide colleges a blueprint uh, to assist with the development of your particular diversity program on your campus, which again is a key component within the DEI strategic plan that is required uh, for submission by July 30th of this year. Uh, the template was built upon elements of a workforce diversity plan that was submitted by each college uh, in December 2020 per the workforce uh, diversity directive state HR directive 20-02. And I'll go ahead and allow Julie to expand on that just a little bit more. So we tried to model the faculty diversity model template off of the Directive 2002 template that State HR and OFM had put together um, so that we weren't asking colleges to necessarily duplicate efforts, but hopefully weave their plans together based on the pieces that were in that directive. Um, and it aligned then <clears throat> with uh, the requirements of the bill with the faculty diversity program. So Hopefully that template looked somewhat familiar and there were pieces that you could pull from the directive and move into your template and sort of the pieces would feed together. So that was our thought process behind why we um, why we sort of went that route with it. And I think, I mean, that's kind of in a nutshell. I think we'll listen to the next slide, but I would just uh, come behind Julie and emphasize um, the approach that we took in regards to integrating the faculty diversity model template guidance uh, to you incorporated uh, and tailored from work that you've already submitted or should have already submitted to the state HR office uh, in the last year or so. So, so this is a body of work that was reflected in, in that document. So as a starting point, that might be something for colleges to consider revisiting. Um, as you look to see what's already been done, what, what you've already updated and reported to the state um, HR office as a whole, and how that might incorporate into your programming uh, uh, for Senate Bill 5194. And I think Julie, you are going to cover this slide just a bit. It's just a quick overview of some of the areas of that HR directive. Yep, so Directive 2002 had sections within it that has, um, has you consider how you've reviewed policies and procedures as they relate to DEI, um, what types of implicit bias training are you implementing on your, on your campuses, looking at data, what, what data do you collect, how are you reviewing it, what kind of process do you use to review it, how often, um, how leadership is involved in review of policies and data, um, and then looking at uh, your interview pools and applicant pools, looking at the demographics and data around that to see maybe, you know, how, how hiring may impact um, from beginning to end. So these are kind of, and these same pieces you'll see in that model template uh, for, that's in that previous link, two slides back. So that's kind of in a nutshell what's included in Directive 2002 and sort of crosses over into that other template. That's great. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Melissa, if you would advance the next slide. Thank you. So we are here uh, also with Dr. Claudine Richardson, who is many of you are probably aware of her good work with our Guided Pathways Initiative through the Student Success Center at the State Board. So I'll go ahead and give her as much airtime as she needs uh, to coordinate uh, and consider with all of you the intersections of this body of work with that of Guided Pathways. So Dr. Richardson, uh, you've got your time. 
Hello, everyone. And I'm going to ask to stop share the screen um, just so I can see some of the spaces and places you're in, some of your faces. If you have the opportunity to do so, please turn on your camera so I can see the beautiful wisdom that is within your faces all across our system um, because I love seeing people, especially now that I work remotely. I think the connections to humanity and your out your soul just virtually can I can feel it right you can feel the needs for connectivity I can see your smiles and, and not just in your your mouth but your eyes in your face and it makes me so happy it just brings joy and so I think the the component of joy is something to hold on to because the reality is when we think about how we do EDI work diversity equity and inclusion or how we do idea inclusion diversity equity and accountability slash assessment it's important important to recognize that it's not easy, right? It really depends on the methodology you want to use, the framework, and where your college culture is. And that's hard to think about because sometimes I used to be a person in my meetings and I'd be like, someone would be like, it's the policy. And I'd look around, I'm like, okay, please point me to Mr. Policy and Procedure because I'm pretty sure we made the policy. I'm pretty sure we made the procedure. And I'm pretty sure unless it's a state or federal mandate, we can unmake it. <laughs> and so why haven't we? And someone would just be like, uh oh, she talking again. Mm, she telling truth. And so I know many of us have been in many spaces in higher education where we could hear the subtone without actually having to speak the language of what we're hearing in different spaces. And that sometimes can account for how we maintain our college culture, right? And so I heard a, a, a executive director at a nonprofit say to me recently, like, strategy is consumed by culture and how and most of the situations we have in our organization are based on the relationships that we have with our team members. And so one of the things I always ask people to think about is I ask people to think about who are your team members, right? Who are your team members and what does that literally that phenotypical culture that when you look at your campus or when you look at the Zoom represent about your organization. And then if you think about your students, who are your students? And how does that faculty and staff representation show up for your students? There was research that was done in 2020 and 2017, 2012, 2009, 2000, that all shared that the experiences that faculty face are the experiences that are mirrored by students and also that those same experiences are mirrored by staff and there was primary five variables but the ones that in higher education we were really good at doing was the one of action we were really good at action <laughs> we are extremely good at taking action without understanding the historical context without understanding the research um, interpreting the quasi data, not just the quantitative, quantitative, but also the qualitative data without necessarily being able to have the support, like we have the support verbally, but do we have the support? And so when you look at um, the connection to faculty relationships and you think about staff relationships and how they support um, students, you really recognize that there's a lot of invisible work being done for student support and success that cannot be accounted for in job descriptions. It cannot be accounted for in numbers or check-ins, like who came to my department, you know, because, you know, some offices got you to know, swipe in or type in your student ID number. It cannot be accounted for because it is invisible labor. It is the labor of just sitting down with the students and saying, how's it going? It's the labor of students being able to walk into your office and just have a conversation. It is the conversation of how you support your fellow team member, whether that be staff or faculty, on how to incorporate diversity, equity, inclusion measures into their curriculum so it would have a an outcome and some, some of those things are not on the job description. And I see some of you nodding because you've experienced this. The other component to that is, I think it's important that when we think about the process of student success, we have to recognize that there's a parallel trajectory for our faculty and staff members when it comes to the success of them as well 
in con concurrently with access, right? If we think about the student experience, we think about, okay, there's inquiry, there is the application, the onboard in the first quarter, the second quarter, and then we're on to access plus success, and then we're on to success and promotion. You know, are they doing well? Did they graduate? Did they transfer? Did they get into a, a economic um, job that could provide for their household well-being and the same thing that i'm so proud of has um, team for doing is that they recognize that the same thing that needs to be done for our faculty and staff members um, president michael baston said from aspen institute he said until we can kick our institutional tires vision and mission statement and see that we're not only promoting the step the success of our students but also of our staff we've fallen short in higher education for our roles because they're the ones that will end up supporting our student success and it's not either or it's both they work collaboratively together, as many of you work collaboratively with your teams. And so there's a couple of things that today I wanted to uh, mention. Um, one is this conversation is, is not new about how we diversify phenotypically <laughs> our faculty and our staff members in higher education. It's not new. And how many of you can agree you can use a reaction? If you disagree, please go ahead and use a reaction too. Let's, let's, let's bring you into this space, right? It is not a new conversation. It's a conversation that has been had for many, many years. And it is a conversation that has been historically held on the shoulders of students saying that this is what we need. We need to see ourselves in order to know that these, are, these opportunities are possible. What is new for higher education is the recognition the, being able to recognize that it is beyond the phenotypic hiring like you got to have the representation I remember once I went into office and I told the president I said thank you for interviewing me but you don't want me here and the president said to me how do you know I said I know because when I walked into your office and across your campus there was no one like me I'm like I didn't see y'all haven't prepared visually um for how you plan to recruit and support when a person comes to your campus. So that is the that is the new conversation. How do you support with not only a sense of inclusion, like you made space for them, but a sense of belonging that those persons that you have brought on feel that not only is there a space for them, but their voices can be heard and they will be listened to so that they know that they are valued in the space. And I think this is an extremely important conversation as we think about, well, what does this mean when our applicant pools are getting smaller and smaller and smaller? It means that people have recognized during the pandemic their self-worth. <laughs> they have recognized that they are in a place where they're examining how do I give back, but also how am I valued and supported within the organization? And our students are wondering the same thing when they come into our classrooms, when they interact with us, how we say things versus our body language of what we mean. And those are important intersections for us. Um, there was also another research study that came out that talked about the benefit of diversifying your applicant pool for faculty and staff members. And they found that if you just look at race alone, that 35% of persons um, coming into the institution or existing at the institutions of, as racially minoritized or marginalized individuals provide 35% of the innovation on a campus or within an organization. And when we think about the intersections that are parallel and adjacent to race, as many persons of color have, um, then that didn't just double, that tripled. And so for organizations doing this work in higher education, I'm going to read off a couple of questions that um, came from a conversation that I had with someone. And I'm gonna make sure that I put it in the chat because Christina, um, from the EDI office was so kind to type it up really quick for me. And so those questions are, how will you ensure you are not centering 
a singular experience in higher education when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? How do we ensure that we think about the ways a person will be labeled at a predominantly white institution, as most of our institutions are, coming into a space or speaking in said space for tone, tack, and volume? Are we expecting them to speak in a normative behavior that represents a predominantly white institution, or are we authentically asking them to show up with all their alma, all their soul, all their identity, all themselves into this space? How will the actions of those racially minoritized as an individual who is part of the collective be seen as different and sometimes unwelcomed, right? Do we have some assumptions that are negative that automatically show up in our own minds when we see the individual? How do we ensure we give those racially minoritized access to various sponsors, leaders, and administrators so they are not solely working in a silo? How do we ensure that they have an opportunity so that what is perceived of them and their capability and their ability is not just a singular narrative that is designed by one office or one area or one department? How do we ensure that those racially minoritized can access opportunities through connection to campus members, community, mentorship, and sponsorship? In higher education, 20% of dominant culture members, racially white, those identifying as white, feel like they have access to a sponsor. Less than 5% of BIPOC members feel they have access to a sponsor or no resources on how to get one or find one within their organization. And those things on that list become the invisible rules of how and when we get to have access to opportunities whether we be from a racially minoritized or dominant group, those elements decide whether or not and how we are perceived that show up in benchmarks we call things like evaluations or being a good team member or knowing how to work collaboratively. The other part to that is what I would say is if you have not yet registered for the Student Success Institute on Wednesday, April 13th, you will notice that the learning agenda is a merger of what I've just mentioned, the connection between students, faculty, and staff supporting this work and how their experiences run parallel to each other. And so I would say to you, as many of you have had conversations about student success, how have you mirrored that in faculty and staff success? So we're gonna to try to help you out by thinking about how do you create learning communities? A learning community is important because it prepares the campus for diversification of their faculty and staff members, right? And so many of the times we say, oh, we're going to bring someone in and they're going to help us with our learning community. I'm like, no, no, that process needed to start it before you brought them in. So how have you created and maintained successful learning communities? Not for those who are racially minoritized that must learn the existing culture that is predominantly white, but for those who have been in existence at the institution who want to maintain and continue their anti-racist journey in higher education. There's also conversations there about knowledge specific knowledge um, specific abilities in higher education for your job descriptions and your roles and work. How do you incorporate those into your job descriptions? And then we have in there, um, in terms of your search committees, how do you have a search committee that not only identifies a halo or horn bias, but how do you stop that process and acknowledge it and think about what actions need to take place? It's more than just saying we have an advocate, it's actually making sure that that advocate has action to address what's happening at that time. And then the last component of that learning agenda you'll notice is the component of mentorship and sponsorship. In this learning agenda, we highlight the many beautiful things that y'all are doing at the CTCs. Um, and we also recognize that we need to do some self-reflection. Doing good trouble, diversity and equity and inclusion work entails accountability and assessment of our work. And so I thank you for the time today and your patience, and I hope you have a beautiful morning. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. One of the things I want to add to everything that <clears throat> you shared as well is that 
we have been working uh, pretty intentionally at the state board to reach across to different areas in conjunction um, uh, in doing this work, trying to accomplish this work in a way that is inclusive and incorporates uh, the bodies within our own agency that play a pivotal role. So you'll see them showcased today, and that is the equity, diversity, inclusion team, the HR office, as well as the Student Success Center, which represents the Guided Pathways uh, work. Um, and we do that pretty intentionally. Uh, one, because uh, I think the system in which we've been operating, and particularly, especially uh, as we've continued to consider how we've uh, carried this work forward uh, on the platform of Zoom <laughs> and virtually, um, it can uh, tend to separate us. So to be intentional about working with these particular offices and reaching into each other to collaborate um, and integrate some of this work within the guided pathways efforts that you're already doing, which the, uh, within the HR directives that you may have already done and submitted to the OFM HR office. Um, and then pulling in your equity uh, leaders on your campuses uh, to help inform and center this work with you. Uh, so um, the hope is to showcase that and to role model that here uh, today as, as our approach, uh, but it has, to, it has been an intentional approach on our end. Uh, so I just wanna follow up with that. And thank you again, Dr. Uh, Richardson for sharing and speaking as you always do um, in such a manner that inspires me and I'm sure I'm not the only one. So thank you for that. Uh, so we're going to turn it to um, the highlights of the day and that is the college showcase. So I'm, I'm uh, very happy to welcome summer course from Highline College, uh, Elder Bittencourt Lopez from Pierce College Fort Stilicum, Stilicum and Bonnie Glantz from Spokane Falls Community College to share, to share their incredible work that they've led on their own campuses to diversify faculty and staff. So with that, I'll go ahead and give that to uh, the virtual mic to Summer Korst, if you're here. Summer, I think you are. I am. There thank you, you so much, Ha, and thank you, everybody. My name is Summer Korst. I'm the Executive Director of Human Resources at Highline College. Uh, my interest in faculty recruitment and best practices that yield um, open and equitable searches that hopefully hopefully bring more BIPOC faculty to our campuses. My interest in this began probably about 10 years ago uh, when I was working at the University of Washington and going through graduate school. And um, I participated in a research project with a faculty member there. And at the time, we were still trying to convince department chairs, leaders, search committees, that they would not sacrifice excellence by, by implementing techniques to bring in more BIPOC candidates to their search, to their searches. And I am just so happy that we're at a place now where we're talking about this work in such a different, intentional, inclusive way. I just want to acknowledge how far we've come. Even listening to um, my colleagues here today, everybody's doing this amazing work and the way that the SBCTC system has really wrapped our arms around this, I just wanna commend everybody for your interest and participation. It's, we've come a long way. So thank you very much. Uh, next slide, thank you. So at Highline, we have started some programming that we think we're very excited about. Um, we also acknowledge that this is the first year we've, we have done some of these things. So we still need to measure them and assess their effectiveness and also acknowledge that there's some room for improvement. Um, everything that we're talking about today could be expanded upon and developed to be much more in depth, I would say. So this year, Highline, uh, for the first time, offered a bias literacy training that occurred before we launched 13 faculty searches. We invited all of the committees uh, to participate in this training to discuss competencies that were equity minded and take time to reflect on the consequences of racialized evaluation criteria when it's embedded within the recruitment and evaluation process. We encourage dialogue about implicit biases and the conceptions of merit and fit. 
As you all know, merit and fit are common criteria that are used in faculty recruitments in higher education. These criteria not only have historical implications, but they are racialized and they are not objective and they are deeply embedded in the way that we have historically conducted faculty recruitments. These criteria, um, oh, I'm sorry, before the training, we asked participants to read about the reproduction of whiteness in the faculty search process. We also asked them to watch a series of videos about bias and take the Harvard implicit bias test. Um, Participants then came back to engage in dialogue about what they learned about themselves during this process. So hearkening back to what Dr. Richardson said, the self-reflection process was very important in, um, in the training that occurred. So HR provide, uh, in addition, we told our committees that HR would provide them disaggregated data so that they could monitor the makeup of their candidate pools. Uh, last year, we also used disaggregated data to identify recruitment sources that brought us, uh, brought us minoritized candidates. And this year, we plan to examine the data with the goal of identifying racialized patterns during the recruitment process. So are certain types of candidates um, being eliminated from, from the candidate pool at various stages. So we could identify maybe something is not quite going right. Uh, so that was the bias literacy training. In addition to that, we have implemented a new tool called Spark Hire. Spark Hire is a recruitment platform that's a one-way interview video system. Um, we initially adopted it to provide a more efficient means for conducting first round interviews with the goal and the idea being that we wanted to have increase our capacity to invite more candidates into the first round interview. Committees select or compose general questions for this initial stage of the process. Candidates then receive a link to the Spark Hire platform and they're required to record their answers before a specific deadline. The platform allows candidates to think, take some time to think about their answers before they record them, rewatch their answers and how that came across, and then have they have the opportunity to re-record it if they want a second chance. The screening committees um, then receive links to those video recordings and they have the capacity to watch them on their own time. Um, and then they, at some point, come back together to discuss, discuss those recorded interviews and who they would like to bring to campus for the next round. Human resources, we advocated for this platform because we believe that it's beneficial to candidates and committees. Um, we think it's really convenient for the applicants to be able to do this on their own time, as well as have the committee members review the review the recordings on their own time. And it's efficient, um, again, to bring in a larger pool of candidates and really be more inclusive at this early stage of the search. We also believe that um, the stress of an interview can hinder a candidate's performance. And we hope that this new platform will create a better candidate experience, um, reduce anxiety, and really accommodate those who are bringing in just stress of really being excited about a position, but maybe help those who are um, not neurotypical and provides them a little more time to bring their best selves to this first round of the interview. So those are the cool things that we are doing. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have or discuss these, uh, these new initiatives. Have you gathered feedback on the candidate experience with Spark Hire? Thank you for asking that, Bonnie. So far, so good. I will admit we had one candidate who really said they did not like the experience and they spoke up about that. With that, putting that exception aside, I would say that the experience of the candidates has been positive. They like the opportunity to 
take some thinking time and to, um, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the chat. They, they have expressed that they like the think time and being able to have a little less pressure on them. Um, our committees really, really like it. Jennifer, I see you have your hand up. Did you have a question? I thought I was unmuted, of course. Um, this is just for the first round interview, right? So, so the, the candidates still get the experience of assessing Highline as well in a second or third round interview, right? That's correct. What we have used the Spark Hire platform for is replacing the traditional phone screen, what you would think of the phone screen. So first round where um, the questions are a little more introductory. And again, the goal really being that if we're not having to operate around people's busy schedules, we have the opportunity to invite more candidates to the first round using this tool. And it does, and we would still bring them for on-campus interviews, meeting with the committee, any sort of presentations that were necessary for the search. Um, it, it does not replace those things. Uh, Kendra asks, are you only using Spark Hire for faculty? What is the cost? Uh, we do have to pay an annual subscription. We found Spark Hire through NeoGov. Um, our college does still use NeoGov as our hiring module and Spark Hire is a third party that was we were connected to. And Kendra, I can follow up with you to get you more information about what the cost was. Yeah, Danielle, I appreciate your comment here. Interviews are also a way for candidates to interview the institution and get a first impression by meeting the committee members. Is that lost? Um, I, I would say there probably could be an argument made that there is something lost there. Um, we want to ensure that the candidates all have a very consistent experience throughout the interview process. Spark Hire helps us ensure that in that first round. They are able to connect with our HR team. A lot of customer service and care goes into setting up those meetings and the conversations that they have that my team has with the candidates. So I would say we try to give a really good impression to the candidates who are entering the first round in the way that our HR team interacts with them. And then they get the experience of interacting with the committee if and when they are invited to that second round. Yes, and I'd be happy to share uh, the bias literacy training that we developed. Um, and have you gathered any data on Spark Hire for the second round? That's a great, great question, Stephanie. We're still early in our in our use of Spark Hire, um, but after this year, I do think we will have some good data to reflect upon. Anything else, Ha? Huh? No, I think that was wonderful. Thank you for all the incredible questions. And in summer, if you want to share the Canvas course with us to share out with all the attendees and, and further out beyond that too, we're happy to do that. Yeah, happy to do that. I would just say, please remember, it's just our first time and we it's definitely a work in progress um, and hope, we hope to expand upon it in future years. That's great. Thank you, Summer. Thank you. Oh, I see. Oh, Dr. Mosby. Go for it, John. Cool. <clears throat> Just trying to lower my raise hand. Uh, Zoom still uh, challenges me. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just, first of all, just want to, I like to always support my team and my cabinet. And uh, thank you, Summer. Summer um, and her team have done uh, amazing work um, in spite of the insurmountable challenges that all of our institutions are facing right now um, with the great resignation, a lot of changes and just 
trying to deal with the pandemic and trying to serve students at the same time is extremely problematic. Summer and her folks have uh, done an admirable job and keep challenging, I think, Cabinet and myself to make sure that we provide the best experience for our applicants so they can end up hopefully being part of the Highline family uh, for years to come. So just um, wanted to show my support and give my props. Um, we're in Cabinet right now, so I was able to get away from Cabinet for a few minutes to watch um, Summer. And I would also just say quickly, and I'll, I know um, other folks are going to go, um, this has been a real game changer for our institution, these things. Um, and we are we are gathering as much data as we can and we're learning from that. And we're gonna, you know, adjust, edit, revise um, as needed. Uh, we know more than ever before, like we talk about when we talk about on campus with our students, that it is imperative that we meet students where they're at, that they don't, we don't expect them to come find us. We have to meet them where they're at. The same thing goes for our future employers as well. Um, they come from all different places of life, um, especially now, and we need to do whatever we can to make the experience a positive one to make sure that fit is even more possible. So again, um, thank you, Summer. Thank you, Hi, and others for giving me a few minutes to chat and babble, and I wish you all well um, and have a good day. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Dr. Mosley. You can thank bust you, up everyone. our party anytime. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thanks, Summer. Great. Last week, there was a lot of uh, interest sparked, if you will, to, uh, around the spark hire piece as well. So that is really great work the Highline is launching there. So up on deck here, uh, Pierce District, uh, Elder Betancourt Lopez representing Pierce College Fort Stillicum. So looking forward to hearing uh, about your work and sharing it out with this group, Elder. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, can I do my own uh, share screen? Absolutely. Make sure that you... And I'll, I'll start in a bit. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, SBCTC familia. Uh, my name is Ilder Betancur Lopez. And first and foremost, I am the son of undocumented immigrants. Father's from Mexico, my mom's from El Salvador. And as they journey north to LA uh, later in life, I continue that northern journey. And I now find myself here in Washington. Uh, state uh, serving uh, the students of Pierce College as Vice President of Learning and Student Success. Um, I'm going to share a link on the chat that is our landing page for faculty recruitment that outlines really the approach that Pierce College, we as Pierce College are taking this year and for um, how we really will be doing hiring in the future as well. And um, I'll also highlight some of the website on the um, presentation that I'll provide. And do you all see the PowerPoint here? Okay, and I'm gonna go into presentation mode. Do you see the entire, the one slide only? Okay, great, thank you all. Um, I wanna, so I wanna say that I um, started my career in the community college system um, as a faculty member of psychology uh, back in 2010 and uh, was had the opportunity to serve as chair of the psychology department um, in this in a uh, large community college in Arizona um, and ever since then I've had the opportunity to do hiring particularly faculty hiring and it's been my passion to do to focus on um, uh, recruiting and hiring faculty of color um, so it's the, the work that you'll see here is the evolution of that time um, and really the way it's culminated here at Pierce College. Um, so I was happy to take the lead here at Pierce College. Um, all of this has given us an opportunity at the college to think not just about hiring, uh, but really think about um, two other components. Um, of course, I'll, I'll primarily focus on the hiring process. But I wanna say that this is very much tied to the first year faculty cohort experience that we have here at Pierce College um, and also the tenure process. Um, really uh, resonated what you mentioned earlier, Claudine, about that uh, it's not just about getting them here, but how do you make them, make, uh, them feel welcome in that retention piece. So I'll touch a little bit more, a little bit on those second pieces, but just wanna make sure that it's not just, high, it's not just about the hiring. Um, so focusing here on the hiring process uh, that we take in at Pierce College, 
we are taking a cluster hires approach, um, which is an approach that some universities have already taken. Um, primarily the one that we modeled off of was San Diego State University, which we um, credit at the bottom of the landing page that I shared with you all. Uh, but it, they also take it, took it from research. Um, the cluster hire approach is one in which, essentially it's another word for a cohort. A uh, cohort of faculty are um, recruited, hired under a, a single theme. So there could be various disciplines, but there's a single theme. And for us at Pierce College, as I'll highlight in the landing page, we really wanted to have that theme be black and brown student excellence. The reason for that is because um, for decades upon decades upon decades, unfortunately, we know that our black and brown students have experienced, have, have been disproportionately impacted in higher education, Pierce College being no different. And the only way to address that is by calling it out and saying, this is what we want to focus on. When you skirt around the issue, um, you, there's, you risk losing the focus and you, and you risk disseminating that responsibility away. And so um, with that approach, we, um, so there's a site I, I mentioned, with that approach, we also then started influencing the way the job description started uh, to look. And so most of the job descriptions, or all of the job descriptions have that uh, theme um, within them. So I'll show you a couple of screenshots here, but again, you have the actual uh, site with you. Um, so we worked on this language, um, you know, language about what black and brown student excellence means to us, um, how we are striving to be an anti-racist institution. And of course, we also gave um, uh, credit to the uh, bill um, because it gives us the opportunity to hire additional faculty here at, at Pierce as well. Uh, I won't read this piece, but I'll go to the next piece where as, as you scroll down that site, um, as part of the cluster hire approach and the theme, we ask candidates to address um, a couple of items in their application. So you see them here listed as one through four. So the first is, you know, we're looking for candidate, a candidate who has experience or has demonstrated, uh, demonstrated commitment to teaching, mentoring, and or engaging in services for black and brown students. Two, has demonstrated knowledge of barriers for black and brown students and experience in address, addressing disproportionate impact at an institution. Three, has experience in or has demonstrated commitment in facilitating black and brown students navigating a higher education institution. And four, has experience or has demonstrated commitment to integrating elements of culturally relevant and inclusive pedagogy. So we identified these four items and we asked all candidates to address how they meet at least two of these items um, within their application. Um, a couple of things to note is that while um, the experience would be great, we also wanted to make it clear that the commitment, if, if they haven't had the, the experience, as long as they can demonstrate the commitment by what they know or what they you know, wish to do, um, we are very excited to welcome them and um, have them be part of our learning journey as well in that commitment. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, you'll no notice on our landing page that it also includes uh, professional technical positions, faculty positions, and oftentimes uh, individuals from those areas do not have um, uh, classroom or higher education experience, or at least not as much. Um, and so we made a note on those particular job posts that um, uh, if they don't have that experience with students, but have it within their industry working and supporting black and brown colleagues or um, uh, those who they supervise or you know, in whatever capacity within their field, within their industry, we welcome them to write about that as well. Um, So uh, the other, so as we prepared to receive um, or to read through these, uh, did a um, uh, uh, in, uh, built in within Pierce a um, training with the deans that I uh, helped to lead, which is as we read through these applications, how do we start to discern who are who are really um, uh, addressing the issues here? and who are kind of skirting around. And the framework that we took as we um, read through these um, write-ups is that framework of equality versus equity, right? So it is 
we I've seen before even coming to peers reading similar um, uh, uh, applicant answers to questions like these very much falling into the equality model, right? Well, I help all students, right? And then, and doing that all, all misses the point. Yeah, it's great, but the equality model is what we've been doing for decades and it's not working. Um, so having that framework is uh, how the deans approach this and then share that with the screening committees as well. So something I wanted to highlight in, which, in ways in which we were preparing for um, the screening process. Um, one other thing I wanted to share with everyone is the way in which the faculty, the UC16 listed in the um, landing page, how we chose those specific faculty hires. So we took uh, three steps. The first is that we asked the deans to identify where are their needs, faculty needs in their uh, divisions. So the deans came up with a list. Um, it was around 25 uh, different faculty requests that we had. Um, and we relied on the deans, given that they were uh, that they are the um, experts of their uh, division and are able to identify where the needs are. Then we took those roughly 25 uh, positions and, and we scored them all on five uh, different variables, um, quantitative variables for now, to give us a quantitative ranking of these. And those five variables were, I'll go one by one here, percent of BIPOC student success. So within that division, within that uh, subject area, uh, what is the student success of our BIPOC students? And we ranked higher areas where BIPOC student success was lower because that indicated to us that there was a strong, stronger need there. Uh, we looked at BIPOC uh, enrollment, percent of BIPOC enrollment. In this case, where there were more BIPOC uh, students, we ranked that higher because that's where our BIPOC students are going for whatever reason, uh, but that's where they're finding themselves. And so it was important to us to uh, give that um, a little bit more weight. Uh, the percent of BIPOC faculty in the particular area. Um, in this case, the lower the percent, the higher the need is there. So we rank that. And then two additional uh, variables were adjunct faculty, the adjunct to full-time faculty ratio, and then the total enrollment of the um, discipline. All of this were, all of these were um, scaled um, and gave us a quantitative rank. And then after that, we had the opportunity to have a discussion and re-rank as appropriate because we were able to bring in um, qualitative data uh, that, the, that the quantitative data may not have captured. Um, so through that discussion process, we're able to finalize the 16 that you see on the landing page. But you'll notice here that we really, within the system we use to identify which faculty to go forward with, we're very much aware about um, the needs of our BIPOC uh, students and also uh, BIPOC faculty. So I'd like to just mention um, briefly, uh, we hire, oh, before I go there, let me say one other thing about um, the hiring process. I've now had the opportunity as a vice president to conduct a few of uh, uh, final interviews um, uh, for some of the positions that you see on that landing page. And I wanna say, um, I wanna get personal here. It is very, it has been an emotional um, process for me. Um, I've been doing faculty hiring, like I mentioned, almost 12 years now. And, um, it's not until uh, this process, maybe a little bit earlier, but seeing finalists that are black and brown and sometimes exclusively only black and brown finalists bringing their black and brown excellence, right? So we're, at, we're, we're um, our focus is on black and brown student excellence, but you see that excellence coming through this hiring process has been amazing, it has been emotional uh, to be able to, to see that, particularly in subject areas where Historically, that has not been the case, um, where sometimes uh, institution struggles to get one finalist of color. Um, so seeing, you know, nearly 100% uh, black and brown um, applicants um, has been pretty amazing. 
So to the two other pieces, I won't go too much into these, but I will say that um, at Pierce, we have a, what we call the first year faculty cohort experience, something that Pierce has had for a while, um, a way to create community with the first year faculty and, uh, and help them learn uh, about Pierce College and the different things in Pierce. Well, we're redesigning that now. We're in the process of redesign to refocus on that black and brown student excellence piece. So that we said to these candidates, this is what, we, what we're focusing on so that when they come here, that's not lost. And it's what that first year experience um, will focus on. And uh, just to give you an idea, fall quarter, will be focused on teaching and learning, particularly with our black and brown students. How do we help, help them achieve excellence? Uh, winter quarter, we're focusing on advising, particularly black and brown students. How do we best advise uh, black and brown students? And then the uh, spring quarter, we're focusing on shared governance. Um, so helping them learn the, the uh, committee work that takes place at Pierce College, but from a lens of how do we use that as, how do we become, how do we use that process to advocate for our black and brown students? And then the tenure process, um, we're also redesigning that to align with this uh, black and brown student uh, theme um, because we do not want to create a situation where we bring in all these candidates who come under the impression that they're gonna work uh, on behalf of black and brown students and the tenure process says nothing about it, right? So it's, it's like adding all this labor um, that doesn't align. And instead we're seeing the tenure process as an opportunity to further expand that commitment that they made to black and brown student excellence. And with that, I'll stop sharing and I will take uh, questions. And I think there may be some in the chat. I think Bonnie had a question about full-time adjunct ratio viewed. How was it evaluated? Is that correct, Bonnie? Yeah, I'm just assuming that you gave higher priority to positions that had um, more adjunct to- Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And how has the tenure process been aligned? Have you actually had changes in the requirements or the forms or um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so it's still, you know, something that we're working towards and we have a, a clock ticking, right? Because fall quarter is coming up. Um, I, I wanna say first, of, first and foremost that I, I consider myself very lucky that um, a lot of a lot of how I would imagine doing this, our faculty leadership has already advocated for it, or in, in some cases are already moving on it. And also our uh, faculty union here at Pierce um, is very much on board with this, um, which again, I consider myself very lucky because even in places where I worked in the past, including California, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it makes, it's great to have that, um, uh, collaborative approach in, in this in this work. So yes, looking at all of our um, evaluative forms like student evaluation um, uh, and the course observation and the faculty have already outlined a framework for, for what is called inclusive pedagogy here. And so using that as a basis for those forms. Um, and then very much the way I describe the first year faculty cohort experience, the, what would happen in fall, winter and spring that's how we're imagining, reimagining the tenure process to have those focuses, right? First ten, teaching and learning to black and brown students uh, focus, student advising, and then the shared government piece as well. Um, to an extent, it kind of already has that, not as, um, uh, not in that segmented way and definitely not in a black and brown student uh, focus, um, but that's what we're working to redesign with the union. Any other questions for Elder? Well, I just, I didn't have a question. I, I, I put my comments into the chat, um, but I think I just think it's so powerful this work that your uh, Pierce is doing and that you're leading Elder. And I think about how you, how you just courageously share what it's like to see that occurring and watching it shift right in front of your eyes and you know it lends itself to you know thinking about that very same emotional impact on our students as they walk into their classrooms classrooms that um 
you know, in the history of their time within our educational system may not have afforded them the, the opportunity to see a black and brown faculty member in the front of the classroom. And so I just, that just lands so strongly with me as you were sharing that. Um, and it's just powerful work and the intention and the data informed direction that Pierce took, as well as thinking about the, the entire employee life cycle, not just how do we recruit people to our college, right? But really being intentional about structuring an environment that uh, allows for our faculty and staff of color to come into a space that is their own and they can come in authentically as themselves. And so I just, I appreciate the forethought and the intentionality behind that. And uh, I just want to put that out for Thank you to hear and for, it to, for others to chime in if they'd like as well. So with that, I will go ahead and now pass the virtual mic to Bonnie, who is representing Spokane Falls Community College. Thank you for being here, Bonnie. Excited to, to hear of your good work again as well. Great, thank you. Huh? Um, yeah, let me introduce myself first. Um, Bonnie Glantz, my pronouns are she, a, yeah, and I'm from Spokane Falls Community College. Uh, our college is on the traditional lands of the Spokane tribe, and our district, Community Colleges of Spokane, also serves um, a region that includes uh, the homelands of the Confederated Tribes of Colville and the Kalispell. Uh, this quote that I'm going to share to begin, and I believe that's on the next slide, uh, is a good introduction to the topic, um, do the best you can until you know better then when you know better, do better. And I introduce um, this topic with that because I am going to show you um, some of the dirty laundry of my college um, be before we knew better. So on the next slide, you're gonna see a bar graph um, that's now getting pretty old, but this is from the beginning of our program and this is how we knew uh, we needed to do something different. Um, this data was um, presented to an all administrators meeting and I chose the worst slide. The faculty recruitment slide was the worst. What you're looking at is the percentage of people of color in each stage of our process. So the red bar um, is the percentage of the available labor pool that BIPOC make up, which is about 16%. And uh, in the first bar, you see uh, the percentage of candidates of color that apply to CCS. And you see that it actually exceeds that of the labor pool, uh, which tells me that we were actually doing a good job of recruiting applicants of color. They were applying uh, to our college. Um, and then after HR screened for minimum qualifications, that number went up. So our candidates of color that were applying were very quali were qualified. Yeah, ouch is right. <laughs> Especially once you see that once the committee started screening, the percentage of candidates of color started to drop pretty precipitously, even before we saw the candidates. But then after we saw the candidates uh, dropped again. Um, so we were pretty distressed when we saw this. And the pre president of our college at the time tasked a subcommittee of the Diversity, Equity, and Global Awareness Committee to look into uh, some sort of equity advocates training, some, something that we could do um, to make a fast turnaround. Um, we uh, did some searching online and found the program that's been going at Oregon State University for quite a long time now, led by Ann Gillies. Um, so you're going to see a lot of things that we took from their program. Um, they've been very gracious in um, allowing us to use materials and adapt it to make it ours. But in 2015, so the year following, we saw this the year we saw this slide, we invited Ann to come and give a training at each of our campuses. Yes, her training is excellent. Um, she did um, two, tra two day long trainings with 35 to 40 participants each. And our president insisted that all the deans and directors that screen uh, that chair the screening committees um, uh, do the training right away so that we could get this knowledge into the heads of those folks. And then the rest was just a, you know, y'all come, um, just a volunteer call. And, um, and both trainings were pretty full, both on our campus and on our sister campus, um, which is uh, Spokane Community College. 
the difference at the time was we had a president, which was Janet Gullickson, who um, was really on fire about this. And she, from that first training onward, required that every screening committee on our campus have a search advocate serving on it. Someone that had been through this training um, and understood about biases and that sort of thing. Um, the president who was at our sister campus did not require that, did not really do anything after this training. So the program at their campus didn't, didn't really take off. Um, in, a, in retrospect, it was kind of lucky that this happened because it sort of provided a, a control group, not a perfect control group, but there was one campus using search advocates and the other that did not. So after the first three years of our first training, our HR presented the data on the following screen. And what you're looking at here is the percentage of BIPOC hired at the two campuses over the next three years once we had started our program. Uh, we were excited to see this because even before we saw this data, which was we saw in 2019, um, we already had seen that the dialogues around the table had started to transform. Uh, we were really happy about that, but then um, we were happy to see that the numbers also corresponded. We were starting to impact the percentage of BIPOC we were hiring. So the blue line that you see there is SFCC's uh, percentage of BIPOC that we were hiring. The yellow line is SCC, whose screening committees did not include a search advocate. And you'll see that the percentage, um, not only being included in the finalist groups, but being hired, increased quite a lot during this period at SFCC, whereas the gains at SCC were minimal. Uh, I'm very happy to report that when our current president at SCC, Kevin Brockbank, who's awesome, uh, saw this data, he immediately said, oh, we need to do this program. So um, immediately he announced that we were going to start requiring um, search advocates at their campus too, gave us a little bit of time to train folks, but he um, highly supported and has had quite a few people now trained at his campus and now requires it as well. So over the course of the history with our program, we've had 404 employees across the district complete the full training 332 who are still currently employed, and um, 101 of those employees are at SFCC, 116 at SCC, they've now passed us, and 115 from the district Head Start and this um, CCS Foundation. So this has become very embedded in the whole system, which is wonderful because um, the more people that have this knowledge in their heads, the better. So you might be wondering, well, what is a search advocate? What is this training about? Um, I'm going to go into that on the next slide. Um, quite simply, um, on our in our system, a search advocate is a non-voting member of the screening committee who's been trained in practices that interrupt bias and enhance equity and inclusion in the hiring process. This person serves as a partner and resource to the committee, assisting them to achieve their own goal of conducting a fair, equitable, and inclusive search. You see the language here is nothing about monitoring or enforcing. There's no equity police here. We recognize that this was somebody who could help us to achieve our goal. And because they aren't voting on the content, that frees them up to really focus on the process and see some things that we are going to be blind to as we're just going through our process as usual, as we all have biased blind spots. So um, this person, in the next slide, you'll see an overview of the entire um, search and selection process. And we know that there are um, structural biases and cognitive biases that tend to creep into every single stage of the hiring process. So we um, ideally, we have the search advocate involved at every stage of the search process, at every conversation, at the development of every um, of the job bulletin, uh, the development of all the uh, tools for the search, the screening instrument, the interview questions, the reference check questions, and there to participate in all of the um, conversations. Uh, this wasn't always easy, uh, it hasn't always been easy, it hasn't always happened the way it should. I remember in the first year, uh, or maybe this, even the second year of our process, being invited to serve as a search advocate to come sit in on the interviews. And I hadn't been part of anything up till then, not even the development of the interview questions, much less um, the position description, which is, of course, where you have the most leverage to make um, a difference in institutional um, structural bias. 
Um, but every year we have tried to improve. So since our um, first president launched the program kind of immediately, we didn't have time to make it good <laughs> before we launched. We just launched and did it kind of halfway as well as we could while we scrambled to improve. And, and um, every, every year we're continuing to improve the program, institutionalize it. So we're gonna look at, well, what's the search advocate's role in the process? In the next slide, um, which comes directly from Oregon State University's program, um, their role, we always uh, reiterate that the role is to enhance the validity of the search, which means assisting the committee to forward the best candidates for each position and who couldn't get behind that. Uh, we also want them to enhance the equity of the search, which means uh, running a fair selection process in which selection is based solely on factors related to job performance, removing all of those barriers um, that have traditionally and historically impeded the success of underrepresented groups. And of course, by doing so, uh, we also increase, increase the uh, diversity of our pools and the, the success of our diverse ca underrepresented candidates. So um, the way they do this is um, the actions that they take is on the next slide. Again, as I stated earlier, they're the only person on the committee whose role is solely to attend to our process. So I'm not getting sucked in on what they think of the different candidates that are in the pool, but to really watch the way that committee um, narrows this down, determines who is finalists, et cetera. So while the other committees are focused on that evaluation of candidates, um, on the qualifications for the position, um, the search advocate needs to keep some distance from that. And for that reason, we suggest search advocates serve on committees outside their own department. So they're not part of that departmental culture that we all become blind to just because it's the water we swim in. So their role is to um, stay focused on the process, a healthy committee, test their thinking by asking questions. Um, and also they're trained on best practices that mitigate structural bias. So they could step in if they see um, a process that's not a very good process, um, just happens by default. They can step and say, hey, before we go on, maybe we wanna consider doing this or that. Of course, they do this in conjunction with the chair of the screening committee. They again are not equity police, they are a partnership. And our next slide um, talks about that important partnership. We uh, realized after a couple of years of doing this that we really needed to make sure our chairs understood the search advocates role and that our search advocates understood how to work successfully with chairs. Um, we've written up a document that really outlines what might happen at each stage of the committee on each side, You know what the search advocate might be trying to do, how the search advocate can work with them. Um, and the important, it's so important that the committee stays open to the search advocate questions and suggestions. So obviously they need the support of the chair um, and vice versa. You don't want um, your search advocates to be undermining um, the, the role of the chair either. All right, so I'm gonna jump in and just give a quick overview on what the um, training covers. And um, this agenda, um, is given to the, the uh, participants of the training right at the beginning. So they'll see first we go over the objectives and then we plunge them right into a case study where they can start to see the practical applications, uh, how things go wrong. We then review the uh, search advocate role, mission and actions, something uh, a, a more uh, meaty version of what you just saw. We do a legal overview and start with those concepts of disparate treatment and disparate impact, because we find that's really useful in helping uh, participants to understand the difference between equality, which is our traditional sort of model that we've operated under, and transitioning to equity, which is more about the impact of um, your process. Another significant part of the training is about how unconscious or implicit bias typically can interfere with the equity in each stage of our search. Um, we also have added um, a, a large section on group dynamics and power dynamics and how those it can interfere with a really good search process. It can interfere with each committee member feeling free to express their opinion, which is necessary, of course. And, um, and that unconscious bias, including both cognitive bias and structural bias. So we go quite in depth about that. Um, here are the objectives on the next slide that um, we tell our participants they should be able to do um, at the end. 
that they'll be able to complete each of these tasks. And um, in a few moments, I'm gonna focus quite a bit on number five, which is a tool, a really powerful tool that Anne introduced us to that we've um, even expanded on a little bit, um, but we found it's a very, very effective way to set the groundwork with the committee um, for the whole search. Um, and um, we have also added, like I said, we've added the number four, um, sorry, um, where is it at here? Power dynamics in number six, um, because we found that um, that was something we were seeing in our searches. So this is the way we started doing the training instead of Anne, um, I'll tell you that part. Um, many of you have done Anne's training. No, it's excellent. No, she is a font of knowledge and we never felt um, capable of reproducing that on our campus. So we kept inviting her, paying her uh, to do our training for the first five years of our program. And we knew that was not sustainable, uh, but we found it the hard way one year when we contacted her to, to schedule and her schedule was full. She had no um, availability left. So we thought, well, um, I guess this is the year we're doing it. So we gathered our courage and decided to put together our own training based on her training. We spent the first summer of the pandemic uh, adapting the training for our purposes. Many uh, meetings either on Zoom or on the back patio of one of our trainers homes so that we could um, all breathe fresh air and still continue our training. Uh, we started realizing right away that this um, training was going to be on Zoom, which was pretty imposing to try to think of doing this whole training for our very first time um, on Zoom. And we then modified it, added our own content. We added some research on um, how chronotypes can impact our cognition, our decision making, um, the group and power dynamics, how that can interfere with healthy participation. Um, and we were um, thinking, okay, if we're going to do this on Zoom, we're going to have to really um, make some big changes um, to make sure it was very interactive. If you've been to Anne's training, you know that um, she's obviously had to transition that direction too. But in the early days of her training, it was very much a sort of a lecture format, traditional lecture format with small group activities thrown in once in a while for variance. We knew that the small group activities that are gonna take place in breakout sessions needed to be highly structured. Um, because you can't just walk from table to table and help people uh, get back on task or answer questions as easily. So um, we did change the format quite a bit. On the next slide, um, I'll tell you that um, we did not know if it was going to be possible to keep people's attention and keep them engaged for um, a long training on Zoom. And for our purposes, it worked better for people to take a day out of their regular workday and just dedicate it to this uh, rather than split it up into, you know, tap hour or two hour sessions. Um, we also found that it was extremely effective to have breakout sessions with the same team members all throughout the day. We get them into a breakout session within the first 15 minutes of the training so that they can introduce themselves, um, start to understand how they're going to work together. And we gave them a very um, specific task to come back and be able to share in the chat um, of the uh, Zoom what the results were from that. Um, and um, so that clear structure to have a clear task, uh, we found really leads to many of the groups getting very connected um, at the, by the end of the day, exchanging contact information so that they can continue um, this partnership. Um, we also, of course, used polls in a sort of quiz show format uh, to liven things up and also check for comprehension and used um, that feedback for us um, to, to beef up parts that were, were obviously not um, getting across quite clearly. Uh, our latest addition is that we've added a sort of reader's theater sketches where we all rename ourselves on Zoom to be the screening committee chair or the search advocate or, or the poorly behaved screening committee member. Um, we use the sketches to um, show how that process can go awry and then how a, a search advocate might intervene. And um, we've got feedback that not only is that fun and, and enjoyable, but it's also um, useful in helping visualize what this really looks like. All right, so the tool that I referred to earlier is we call it the matrix. Um, and it has nothing to do with pills, of course, but you see it's a simple grid where you list the qualifications for your job on the left-hand side. Um, you just take a note, is this a required or preferred? 
and you really make your committee talk about the relationship to the job, the criteria that you'll use to tell if somebody has this qualification or not, and in what amount, whether this is a transferable skill. Um, our our uh, previous uh, presenter, Ilder, showed how many of those skills are transferable. They can come from industry. And then what stage are we gonna really rely on to assess whether the candidate has a skill and how important is this qualification relative to others? I'm gonna walk you through each of those in the next few slides, but you can see how it'll kind of fit into the rubric that we use. So the first column that is really important here that we often, I've seen a lot of searches where we never even ask ourselves, well, why is this qualification important? How is it used on the job? What parts of the job? Um, would be difficult or impossible, or what parts could they do better if they had this? And then um, that conversation is really useful, by the way. It makes you rethink things a lot, and it also clarifies in your mind, you know, why we're even asking for this. Um, it gets the whole committee on one um, page. The last point there is um, is one that I often really push. Um, in the olden days, when we started this program, a lot of committees. Um, in, as required qualifications really ask for experience, right? Experience in this, experience in that. And um, we all know that somebody can be very experienced at something and still not be have a high le skill level in that um, ability. So the example I like to give is how many of us have had instructors that have been doing that for a very long time and are actually very ineffective instructors. And almost always somebody can remember at least one of those and say, so years of experience doesn't necessarily equal the quality and the ability, the, the ability level that they have. And what we're really trying to get at is the ability level they have. And most of the time, we, we the reason we do those proxies is because it's easier certainly easier to look at somebody's CV and say, oh, they've got three years of customer service experience. They must be really good at customer service type jobs. Maybe, maybe not. So we say, well, how, how will we be able to tell if they have those if it's not based on experience and really push the thinking? Um, some of those we decide, oh, well, we can't really tell that in that first stage. We won't really know that until we get to, get to meet them, or we won't really know that until we talk to their references. So that's the first um, really important column. And then um, the next slide, we ask, okay, now that we know what skill we're looking for, is it something that someone could learn in one setting and then use in another setting? A lot of careers actually include a lot of teaching, for example, um, and I'm, I'm gonna, re uh, the reason I rely on teaching so much, I'm obviously a, an instructional dean. So most of the hires I do um, are for instructor positions, but um, also uh, it's been true in our secretary or administrative assistant positions. Um, people say, oh, I want someone that's really familiar with um, academia. So they have to have experience in academia. And I think, well, do they really? Because could they actually have the skills of learning an academic um, system? very quickly if they have learned another system very quickly. So I really force them to say and, and open it up so that we're not in unintentionally making our pool even smaller than it should be, cutting out people that have the skills we're looking for, but just not in the context that we operate in. So really looking at that context. All right. And then um, the most important um, part of the matrix um, in, at all is this one. Um, what would indicate to us that the candidate meets this qualification? How would they demonstrate it? How could we tell that they have this? And then once we write down um, one thing, um, we say, okay, that's one way, but how else could they, um, how else could they do it? What else? And then what could distinguish a candidate who has a higher level of this competency from someone who has a lower level of that competency? And once we've listed as many ways that we could do that, we say, okay, can we think of someone who we still could be excluding that might be good at this job? Um, and, and really testing our thinking um, pushes us to really um, expand the ways that we're um, allowing people to show that they possess these competencies besides the traditional road. And then the last part is pretty simple, but again, it pushes the thinking, how can we tell at which stage are we gonna tell? And if we think we're gonna be able to tell it at the interview stage, what will it look like at the interview stage? Or how would a reference talk differently about a candidate that has this versus someone that doesn't have this, et cetera. So this really helps because when we get to 
um, past the screening stage when we're designing our interview um, instrument, we just add a column to the matrix and say, okay, this is what we said we're going to tell by the interview. So what kind of interview question would really get at, you know, would show us this stuff that we said we were going to see. So it's a really effective tool. Um, and the last part, of course, is determining the weight. Um, if it's required, how important is does it have extra strength or is it just a check mark? And if it's preferred, um, will somebody that's stronger in this qualification perform better at the job? If not, better re-examine this preferred qualification, um, why you have it there at all. And then, you know, among the preferred qualifications, which are most and least likely to predict success and to really rate those more strongly when you're looking at candidates. So one of the other things that we talked about is how we are, um, you know, how we are casting our net out also tells a lot about us to the candidate. So we looked at what are we doing on our um, job bulletins that indicate what kind of college we are and whether or not they'd want to work for us. So really looking at it as a two-way process. And um, a few years ago, we put um, out some language that's on the next slide that we put at the top of all of our um, all of our job bulletins come out with this on the top. And the reason we did this is um, we wanted to indicate who we were, um, what our values were, who our students were, and how we see ourselves serving our students. So we put in things like that we're on the ancestral home of the Spokane tribe because we want people to come to our college that find that um, interesting and valuable and want to be part of that work. Um, we also mentioned the Air Force Base. We mentioned the rural district, part of our districts, because we really wanted folks to know, you know, there's a lot of this kind of need here. And then we close with parts of our mission statement that parts of our ideals of who we are and what we're trying to do as a means of hopefully attracting people that also have these values and these ideals. What's interesting is we did this before our college even had developed um, a land acknowledgement, but many people look at this and they think of it as a land acknowledgement of sorts. And I've already heard from folks that have been hired since we started doing that, that this piece was really important to them in deciding, I wanna work there. Um, one of our recent hires that came in this summer, she had previously worked in, um, in Idaho and which is just 30 minutes to our east. And she had not had a great experience there and said, I'm not sure I wanna work in Spokane. Spokane's awfully close. Their community college might be a lot like um, the experience I had. And um, when she saw this, she said, oh, wait, this is totally different. This is at the top of their job bulletin. And of course, words don't mean that you are who you say you are, but it does show, like I said, some values. Um, and she is really happy that she did apply, she's here. And in fact, she's here on the training. So thank you for applying. We were really glad and lucky to get you. All right, so um, the next slide shows you that this has been a team effort. Um, I was involved from the beginning of this process as was Lori Hunt. Uh, Lori at the time was at SEC. She's now our acting provost. Grace Leaf was um, important in pushing us to grow and put on the training by ourselves. I don't think without her push, we, um, we would have felt brave enough. Guillermo joined the team um, also after the first round and he's been an excellent addition. He's, um, we call him our search advocate superstar. He's served as search advocate for a lot of searches and is really good at it. And Angela Rasmussen is our, uh, Yes, thank you, Claudine, for pointing out Ada Estrada, who is no longer with us, unfortunately. She did support the rebirth of the online program. And Angela is our latest um, ad. She is English faculty uh, by POC, and she's excited to join us. We're actually having a meeting next week where we start to divvy up the training in a different way so that we can include her and Mackie Snyder. Mackie is our latest ad from Human Resources. And um, because it is a team effort, this has been, it's been possible to embed this in um, our campus culture such that if one of us, for some reason, chose to go somewhere else, I'm not going to say one of us is going to get hit by a bus. I rather think that one of us might win the lottery and go off to pursue other um, philanthropic um, it, it, efforts. So if one of us leaves, though, the, hopefully it's strong enough now that it will continue. Others will take up the mantle and that we will continue to um, 
to make our conversations different at that screening table. So that's all the information I've prepared. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and uh, if not, or if you'd like to ask them later, you're free to uh, contact me via email, set up a, a Zoom. I'm always happy to talk about um, this program. And um, you know, the, you can learn from our mistakes. You know, we we haven't done everything perfectly, and there are some things that we can look back and say, "Ooh, um, this really helped," but this we should have done differently. So, I'm always uh, open book there and happy to um, share with any of you that have questions. Thank you. That was great, Bonnie. I'm going to leave room for any questions or sentiments that are surfacing. I'm not sure if you saw that. Yeah, uh, Claudine just um, encouraged me to mention, we do have a Canvas shell where we make all our resources available to all our search advocates and that they can use to um, see who else is search advocates. They can you know, then um, ask each other questions. Um, it's, it's we're trying to establish a bit of a learning community um, where they can, um, it's just a resource. Um, and now that we've gotten so many people involved, there are more people that you can consult if you're, you know, having a question or a difficulty or dealing with a sticky issue. So thanks for the prompt, Claudine. That's great, Bonnie. I, I know one thing I appreciate every time I hear you talk um, is the emphasis on the capacity that is growing between the two colleges and that you're able to sort of utilize your district as a comparative between a college that didn't utilize the search advocacy approach and then one that did and what the, the data outcomes on that were in the hiring process. So having that comparative to work from as, as well as, and I think you mentioned at the last event last week that there was a moment in time most recently where everybody around the interview table were, had been trained as search advocates. So there was no longer a singular individual a uh, lonely only, if you will, at that interview table, tasked with um, emphasizing and amplifying uh, the issues that come with uh, the hiring process around this particular topic, but that everybody around that table uh, was trained with an approach that um, I think emphasizes the commitment that the, that your district has made, it sounds like, mm -hmm. um, and continues to grow. And you've expanded across the system as well. I know State Board has had uh, yourself and Grace pre-COVID times <laughs> come and do a, 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 a report and update and uh, a semblance of a, a training with hiring level managers at that time. Uh, it might be good for us to revisit that a little bit as well. So you've, you've prompted that, planted a seed in my head in that way. So thank you for that, mm -hmm. Bonnie. And I think for purposes of all three colleges that were showcased today, you know, we got a, uh, a real good glimpse of where Highline's headed, some of the tools they're utilizing, the direction they're going, um, some of the reflection that they're asking of their candidates um, to share and think about. Uh, so emerging work from Highline sounds like Pierce has really dug in. Um, into their work a little bit further, has noticeably seeing that the impact of that work already. And then of course, uh, Spokane District has some uh, five years data set uh, to refer to on the impact of the search advocacy. So just incredible work. I just wanna thank uh, those individuals for coming into this space with us and sharing that. Hopefully there were nuggets of information that was shared that uh, landed for you as an attendee in this space and feel free to make contact with our office specifically, Julie's office, Julie Huss, our HR director as well, directly. Uh, we'll also be sharing the PowerPoint slide deck to include all the information that you heard today with contact information as well. So I just want to leave uh, just space for anybody else, any kind of comments or questions that you might have in regards to this particular item uh, that many of our colleges have been working on for quite some time and others have the opportunity to dig in just a little bit further. So I'm just gonna leave some space for that. And I'm not seeing anything come up and I, I, I think I just wanna end by saying thank you to all of you. And we are here should you need anything, uh, a, th a thought partnership, uh, 
considerations of, of how it intersects with your guided pathways initiative in planning, uh, your HR work as well. So feel free to reach out however, whenever you need. <laughs>